Welcome to Garden of Lights. I'm Susan Howington, Family Consumer Science Agent with the Henry County Corporate of Extension, partnership with the University of Georgia Corporate of Extension. Today we're going to talk about pineapples and we're also going to hear from Frank Hancock, our Agriculture and Natural Resource Agent. So we'll see you back in just a little bit on Garden of Lights. Welcome back to Garden of Lights. Today we're talking about pineapples. And you know, pineapples are mainly in season, May through June, you know, some of that's time, but to me, pineapples are in season all the time. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of eating that pineapple. And I have, I don't have a, the real one, but it's been cut through and you can see that I have it. And it is so good because it's really not bad on the calories. So you can eat about a half of a cup for 34 calories. And that's about, you know, little chunks of pineapple. But it's also cholesterol free, fat free, very low in sodium, and it is very, very high in potassium. So, you know, if you're trying to get potassium in your diet, there you go, pineapples. So when you're selecting your pineapples, even when I buy them already, you know, cut and, and done like this at the grocery store, I'm still gonna look at them, make sure they look really plump, um, there's not too much juice because then I know then it's been cut and, and prepared for me to buy just recently and I also look at the dates too which is important but when you're buying the real deal the pineapple before it's ever been cut you do want to pick it up and look at it you want to make sure that the eyes are not sunk down that they're very firm looking and when you pick it up it's going to be probably heavy hopefully and that means if it's heavy it's a lot of juice in it, so that's even better. So when you're looking at your pineapple, study up on them a little bit so you'll know what you're picking out because if you're gonna go home and cut it yourself, I want you to make sure you have a really good one. So as storage goes, pineapples are not gonna store in your refrigerator for a long time once you cut it, so it's about three days. So hopefully you know in those three days, you know exactly what you're gonna do with that pineapple. Now if you buy one at the grocery store and it hasn't been cut, you can keep it a little bit longer. But I will tell you this, to prolong it a little bit longer, you can can it, and you can freeze it. So there you go. If you can't do it in three days, you got other alternatives and that's freezing or canning that pineapple. So when we come back, we're gonna hear from Frank Hancock. He's gonna be out at Miller's Mill and I can't wait to hear what he's gonna talk about. So we'll see you back in just a little bit on Garden Delight. Today, we've come out here to Miller's Mill, uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about history today. We're going to talk about some of these water-powered mills, in particular this one here at uh, Miller's Mill. And uh, Mr. Ray Miller is here with us today, and he's going to tell us a story of Miller's Mill and how it came to be. Uh, water power was the main thing that people had back in the in the past to, to do work with and to grind uh, meal and to gin cotton and run lumber mills and all that kind of thing. And uh, there's was about 20 of them located in Henry County in the past. So I want to turn it over to Ray, let him tell us about Miller's Mill. Okay, appreciate you coming out today, Frank. There's been a mill uh, here on Cotton Indian Creek since the early, 1830s. Silas Mosley was one of the original settlers in Henry County and he built the first mill across the stream from here over on the south side of the river and it was a water-powered mill but there was no dam here at that time. There was a long raceway that would have started back upstream maybe even a several hundred yards and then it would have been built down to uh, established head, that's the height of the uh, top of the mill wheel, and it would have produced the water. So it was a very simple mill, it was only to grind corn. Later, probably around the Civil War, uh, a dam was built, it was wooden construction, uh, just upstream from the current concrete dam, and it then provided a lot more efficient power 
and enable them to also have a cotton gin and they then move the mill across the stream uh, to the north side and built a larger mill that was a combination corn mill and cotton gin. And then in the 1890s, the Mosleys sold the mill property to the Hintons and uh, Lon Hinton was the person that then owned the property up until 1925 when my grandfather, Dave Miller, bought the property from the Hennons. And so from 1925 until we ceased operation around 1960, uh, we were running a corn mill, a cotton gin, and a lumber operation consisting of a sawmill and a planing mill. So we can move on downstream and I'll explain to you uh, how the water uh, was transported down to that area. Okay, let's take a walk. Okay. Okay. okay, now the, the water came down the mill race and of course when the it was in operation, this entire thing was full of water up level with the dam. And then one race went out to the corn mill wheel. Okay. And then the race around in front of the mill went down to the turbine house, which drove the sawmill and the planing mill. And then on around to the mill, to the gin wheel, which ran okay. the cotton gin. And I understand that was a little bit of an engineering feat to get where they could drive that turbine. And, and also, uh, you generated a little electricity for the neighborhood. Yes, we did. Uh, in fact, I have a letter written by the local uh, turbine company to my grandfather explaining that it would not work what he was going to do. Uh -huh. Well, it did not work for almost 100 years. So, okay, uh, yeah. very interesting. All right, and so this is where you, you you harness your water right here to run the mill, and I guess the door was shut right down here. That well, actually, the gate was over the wheel. Okay. And you would close the gate on the wheel. Right. And in the uh, fall of the year, when we were ginning and it was dry, sometimes the water would be a little low, and we did have a Caterpillar engine back of the gin that we could okay. start and help. Right. So you had, had a little bit of yes. engine backup sure when you did. needed it. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. And so, uh, so now you're running two wheels, uh, one for the cotton gin and, and, and one for the mill. Right. And um, that's a, a plus a turbine that's, that's running the sawmill and generating a little electricity. So it's quite an operation going on here. And I, I guess you're able to, to, to do work year round. Then. Yeah, that was sort of like the old companies that sold ice and coal. Uh -huh. We had something going. The corn mill ran year round because a meal would become rancid. So families would come to the mill maybe every two or three weeks and grind just enough to last for that period of time. Okay. Then the ginning season started in the fall and would run up till about Christmas time. Okay. Then the lumber operation, my grandfather did that when he was not running uh, the gin or the mill. Okay. Yeah. You got the mill back in operation back? Yes, in, in 1981, uh, I was still working at the time, but with the help of a lot of friends, uh, I began to rebuild the large raceway that ran out to the mill wheel. And I had to rebuild the mill wheel itself. Uh, woodworking is a hobby of mine. It took me a year and a half to build a wheel. Okay. And so we worked on it for a period of 10 years and finally got it going. Unfortunately in 2000, a vagrant built a fire in the mill and burned it down. Well, I'll be, uh, that, was, that was a shame, that was a lot of history. Uh, so we can move, once again, let's move on down a little closer to the cotton gin, and then yeah. you've got all sorts of historical buildings out here. I understand that your 
Uh, grandfather was a blacksmith. That's correct. And uh, the blacksmith shop is still standing up the it road is. there. And we've, we've seen where Highway 155 ran right down through here across an old bridge over here that uh, just a lot of history that nobody knows about. Yeah. Well, Frank, this brings back a, a flood of memories for me. I was just looking down in the raceway here. It was only about four and a, four, four and a half feet deep, and we all learned to swim in the race. Okay. And then between these two posts up here, my father and I, after we ate supper, which was just across the creek, we come over and take our bath in there. Okay. I remember the medicinal smell of life boy soap uh -huh. so you made sure you didn't drop that in the sand or you had lava soap uh -huh. okay. but there's just uh -huh. a lot of memories here okay the water ran down the race and then the turbine house was used to provide the power for the sawmill and the planing mill and the water ran out in it and the turbine house was full of water 16 feet deep and so on the bottom was a gate, and when it opened, uh, all of the water running out the bottom provided the power to, to do the sawmill and okay. the planing mill. All right, and the it, turbine turned, it, it turned horizontally. It turned so. this way, and then there was a series of belts and pulleys that turned it into this motion. Okay, all right. Now this is the ruins here of the mill house itself and you can see the the big wheels everything ran on a series of belts and one interesting thing was some of the equipment if you had it positioned in the mill it would have to run backwards so you all you did was put a a twist, twist in, the in the belt and it would run it in an opposite direction okay on beyond here then we've got the cotton gin right and uh I was told that the turbine shaft might still be in there. But... Yes, it is. It's still there. And the wheel, of the overshot wheel for the gin is still intact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That'd be all. Okay. Well, let's walk on down there. See. Okay. Okay, Frank, the water running down the raceway, if you can imagine this full of water, it ran into the turbine house here. And of course, when it was not in operation, everything was just standing. Uh, the water didn't have to run anywhere. Okay. And then the water ran around to the overshot wheel to run the cotton gin. Okay, and that, a, that wheel is still there. That wheel is still there. And there was a gate over it and it had a big uh, lever up in the gin house where you would open the gate to run the water. And as I mentioned before, uh, in the fall, if we needed auxiliary power, there's a Caterpillar engine in the back uh, that okay. we used. So the wagons would come down this way and go in. The first step of the gin was uh, there's a suction pipe there and you would suck all the cotton off the wagon okay. uh, up into the uh, gin. And then there's a series of three gins uh, that the cotton would run through and it separated the seed uh, from the uh, fabric. And then it went back to a press and the cotton ran in there and was pressed into a bale. Okay. And everything, even the hydraulics parts of the mill, every, of the gin, everything ran on the water power. So after you compress the bale, then uh, you would then put bag and ties. It was a big burlap bag that went around the bale and some metal ties. Yeah. And then it went from there onto a pickup truck and hauled up on the hill for Planner's Warehouse to pick up the bale of cotton. Okay. Because you had the option, uh, Planner's Warehouse would buy the cotton or they would store the cotton if you thought the market might go up or uh, in the meantime. And then on the seed, there was an option. We would buy the seed from you or you could keep the seed and we would charge you, I think it was $7 and a half to gin the bale of cotton. 
And the, the seed that we accumulated, we took to an oil mill uh, in Atlanta to be processed. And about how many pounds of, of raw cotton does it take to make a bale? A two horse wagon would hold about 1,100 pounds. So it took about 1,100 pounds of cotton to make a 350, 400 uh, bale of cotton. Okay, and so the rest of that is seed? Yes. All right, that's very interesting. Okay, I think we're gonna move around here and take a few more pictures and then we're gonna go in and see what Susan's fixing in the kitchen. Welcome back to Garden Delights. Today we're making pineapple fluff and it is so good, so easy. So let's start with the recipe. So I want to tell you what I've done a little ahead of time because I want to make sure you can see how it kind of goes together. So the first thing you want to do is you're going to make the crust part that's going to crunchy part, I say crust part, crunchy part that's going to go in here eventually. So what you're going to do, and I'm going to kind of show you what it looks like so you'll kind of get an idea. So you'll want to put some parchment paper in a pan just like I have here. And what this is, is one cup of pretzels that are chopped, you know, crunched up as good as you can crunch up. Just about a fourth of a cup of pecan pieces. And then also it's half a cup of sugar and one stick of margarine or butter. So you're gonna put this and mix it all together. And then you're gonna put it in the oven at 400 degrees for seven minutes. Don't forget it, or to burn. So once you get that, you wanna cool it down because you're gonna use this to crumb it all up to put into the other ingredients. So let's move on to the other ingredients. So then you're gonna need, and I'm trying to use as much as I can as far as light or fat free. So this is cream cheese, this is fat free cream cheese. And the recipe is gonna say one cup of sugar. So half of the sugar is gonna go into this part, the other half is gonna go with the cream cheese. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix the cream cheese and the sugar. Now the cream cheese, you do want to have it at room temperature so you can mix it because if it's cold, it's not going to mix well at all. So I've already let the cream cheese set out for a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of mix it in. And I want it to be fluffy, so I'm going to try to keep from sending it out on the table and keep it in the bowl. So you can see it's creaming up very well and that means because I left the cream cheese out, and you want it loose, you want it like this creamy because you're gonna, move, uh, you're gonna move into the other parts of the ingredients and you wanna make sure it mixes very well. So I think I have the sugar and the cream cheese mixed up very well. You can use two and a half cups of chopped pineapple and I've taken the same pineapple from like this, taken it, sliced it really thin, and then I chopped it up. You also can use a 120 ounce crushed pineapples, but if you use that, you're gonna to have to drain it because you don't want the liquid, so you make sure you drain it very well. So the reason why I wanted to use it this way because I wanted to use as fresh as I could do. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix this in and kind of mix it in with the cream cheese first, and then I'm gonna move into the fluff part of it. So that's gonna be the, the whipped topping. So I'm just gonna move this around just a little bit to kind of get it incorporated because I wanted to make sure the Cool Whip also is easier to move into the other ingredients as far as moving it around and stirring it around too. Because I don't want to, I want it loose and fluffy. I don't want it, you know, compact. All right, so I have that done. And then I'm gonna work in my fluff. So the recipe is gonna say about 12 ounces of fluff. So that's about 12 ounces of it. And I'm gonna go ahead and move this into the bowl. I want to make sure I get it all. So I'm going to move this into here. This is the fluff. Let's see if I can set this down in this bowl and kind of stack some here real quick. All right, Let's see if I can move it out a little bit so I can get toward the center. And so you're just going to kind of move this around. You don't want to compact it, so I'm just going to kind of stir it to the, you know, till I get it. And to me, using the fresh pineapples, you can really see it and see all the good colors. And I will tell you, these pineapples right now are so good and they're so good for you. So just think about it when you're trying to find something good to eat. 
something to carry somewhere, this is a great recipe. I do want to make sure that I'm, you know, flipping it over. I want to make sure that I get the cream cheese mixed in with the fluff. I don't want it all at the bottom, so I'm going to kind of keep going to make sure. And I also want my pineapples mixed in very well, too. I don't want them at the bottom either. So I'm just going to keep moving it around just to make sure it's all in there. This is going to serve about 10 people, depending on what size you, you serve them. So it'll serve about 10 people. Okay, so I have this pretty mixed up pretty well. And so now I'm going to take the crunch part of it. So uh, like I said, I baked it. So you can see it's, uh, to me, it's almost like a brittle. So I'm going to go ahead and put some of this in here, but I'm going to save some out for decoration on the top. But I am going to go ahead because when you're eating it, you're also going to have a nice crunch to it too. So it's amazing how you can mix just a little bit of butter and a little sugar and how when you bake it, it mixes together and makes like a wonderful little crunch for it. And you can use this on anything that you're trying to, to make. So I will tell you this, you want to make sure you do it toward the right before you serve it because the longer you leave it in the Cool Whip mix, it's going to um, become soft. So you want it crunchy. That's the whole goal is to have it crunchy. So I'm going to keep putting more in here and I'm going to stir it around once I get it all in there. And this is just going to get a, another texture, another great taste to it. And I'm going to try to get as much as I can in it, but I do want to leave some for the top to decorate. And I've also, I'm going to cut a little bit of pineapple up to make sure it's also in there too. So this just gives it another nice color. Make sure I get these pieces small enough so when you eat it, and I think I'm going to save the rest of it for the topping. So I'm going to wipe my hands off real quick. And I'm just going to stir this in going to kind of flip it around just to make sure I get it all in there. And I wish you could smell it between the pineapple and the pretzel mixture. It smells so good. It feels like I just baked something. All right. So that is the pineapple fluff. And you can see it's got a little texture to it. And so I know I want to add I'm going to chop up, and I'm going to get some of this off of my, my spatula, though, and I'm going to get it off the side. So I'm going to put this down. I'm going to add a little bit of the crunch because I want people to realize there's other things in there besides just pineapple. So just to make it a little decorative, you can kind of put it on top. And then also, too, when you're serving it, if you're serving it in small bowls to people, you can even chop up some pineapple to put in it, too. So it just kind of gives it a nice texture gives it a nice look besides just the, the whip topping. So I just want to make sure I have enough on there to give it a good look, just to decorate it a little bit. All right, so I have that. I'm going to wipe my hands one more time, and I'm going to see if I can't move some of this around. See if I can just fold that over. I think I'm going to move this down to the bottom. So I do want to show you, I want to go ahead and um, chop up just a little bit of the pineapple. So you can just take it, make a little chop, you know, however you want to do it. I'm just going to chop it up and kind of put it on top just to kind of let people know that it is pineapple fluff. So I'm just going to chop this a little bit up, kind of place it on the top. Give it a little decorative look. And let me tell you, this is so easy and so tasty. You're going to love this recipe. So we'll see you back in just a little bit when Frank and I will be tasting this pineapple fluff. Welcome back to Garden Delights. Frank, we have pineapple fluff and I can't wait to taste it because the whole time I was making it, it smelled so good. All right, well, I've been hoping I could get some pineapple fluff. You were hoping it, weren't you? Yep. Well, I'm getting ready to spoon you some up, it too. Looks like a spoonful. Yes. You want more? Or you want as. I think that's probably enough to All start. All right, with. we'll start like that then. I want to make sure I get some of this crunch, too. And I make sure I get a little pineapple. All right. I'm so looking forward to trying it. Mmm, that's good. It's almost like we're eating ice cream. Mm-hmm.
I wish I could have been out there at Miller's Mill with you. Miller's Mill is an interesting place. That's uh, we had Ray Miller out there giving us a blow by blow account, and he grew up there. He was telling how they learned how to swim in the mill race, you know, and that's where they, that's where they bathed in the mill race, and so he knows a whole lot about it. He's been around a while. He told us a pretty good story. It was a lot of activity went on out there. Yeah, you don't realize how much history you have right here in your own county. Mm -hmm. In the store, sits there next to Highway 155, but the old store is right behind it, and the old store faced Highway 155 when Highway 155 was not where it is today. And you go down through a fence there, and the old bridge that was across the creek is right down there. So Highway 155 actually ran right down past the, the where the old the store, old store is. is. Yeah. Awesome. So it was very interesting. I bet it was. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. So you're going to love this recipe. The pineapple fluff is so tasty, so good. Check out the website. You're going to love it. And Frank and I will see you next time on Garden Delights. Okay.